it's good to be back with you uh, once again for Holy Week. Uh, just this most important week of the year, and it's wonderful to celebrate it in this most beautiful island. It's a it's an uncomplicated, straightforward story that we recall this week. Unlike some of the other great truths of the Bible that are revealed in metaphor and poetry, the events of Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday happened in real time, and to the best of our knowledge, pretty much just as they are recorded. The happenings of these three days provide the framework for what all these centuries later we still claim to be at the heart of being a Christian. And of course, they lead up to our core faith claim that we'll celebrate next week on Easter Day. There was a Palestinian Jew named Jesus, born at a time when his country was occupied. He was an itinerant preacher who proclaimed a message of unconditional love for friend and foe alike as being at the heart of God's vision for the world. In fact, he said each one of us already has the kingdom of God in us, and our mission in being his disciples is to give life to this love in the world. He also proclaimed God's absolute and unwavering love for each of us and all creation. He went on to say that people will come to know God by our love, by our love, not not because of our doctrines or our religious practices, but by our love for one another and neighbor, including those we have nothing other than our shared humanity in common with, and including all those people we really don't like very much. Now, good news as this all sounds, he ruffled the feathers of the political and religious leaders of his day. And we know how this message continues to ruffle the feathers of many of our political and religious leaders. Just like them, many in authority today want to impose doctrine and practice and rules as a means of control, yet framed as religion. But Jesus had no patience for any of this. Rather, it was simply by our love, our generous, unselfish love, that we are to be known. Jesus opened his heart and mind to all sorts and conditions of people, and he was deeply critical of the walls we build to separate us one from another. Well, we read that he was generally encouraging, compassionate, and upbeat, and kind of fun at a party. He could also see right through hypocrisy, and he could lose his control, like a couple of Sundays ago when he turned over the money changers' tables in the temple. Despite that the authorities were becoming increasingly angry with his message, many more were intrigued, realizing that he is indeed the way, the truth, and the light in this world. They followed him, as continues to happen all these generations later. Soon, his followers became convinced that he was in fact the long-awaited Messiah, and then some generations later, proclaimed that he was indeed the Son of God, who came into the world in human form. Through him, we have been given the most intimate understanding of God we humans can possibly grasp. They will know us by our love. It's crystal clear and yet a radical statement. As our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, reminds us repeatedly, it is the central message of Jesus and is essential for addressing the challenges facing our world today, poverty and racism, selfishness, deep ideological divisions, and competing claims to speak for God. So we arrive today as the throng of Jesus' followers march him into Jerusalem with their palms. But his triumphant entry is a sort of parody of the crowd's messianic expectations. He didn't arrive in a chariot as the head of a conquering army, but on the back of a donkey. This is the king who is also a servant. And where does this new king go once he triumphantly enters the city 
not up to the palace for an important conversation with the political leaders, but to the temple to make things ready for the worship of God. Jesus clarifies that as his followers, our first allegiance must always be to God, who is our true Lord and Savior. Choose this day who you will serve. And his demonstration of servant leadership is not about being weak or a doormat, but about never forgetting that the priority of any earthly leadership ought to exemplify God's unconditional love for everyone. There's a great story about Mahatma Gandhi, who was not a Christian, as you know. Yet when he came to England in the 1930s, at the height of the crisis between the United Kingdom and its colony, India, the first place he went to visit was the textile workers in Lancashire, the very ones who had been hurt by the Indian boycott of English textiles. He spent time listening to their stories, and he attempted to explain to them his aspirations and why he was leading India in this way. He acknowledged their humanity and their suffering, and only then did he make his way to Buckingham Palace. Well, back to Jesus. It did not take long for the government to move into action. In just a few days, on the same night that Jesus gave his disciples the commandment to love everyone as self and the Eucharistic meal to nourish them and the generations to come after for this ministry, Jesus was arrested. The following day, Pilate, the empire, the state in which we put so much of our hope, gave its final verdict upon King Jesus, crucify him. He went to the cross because he was unwavering in his commitment to God's way of love, compassion, inclusion, and reconciliation. Bishop Curry implores us to choose the human community because it is the beloved community of God, or what Desmond Tutu often, recall, often called the dream of God. It is the thing that can, and the only thing that ever will, make the world a better place. And this is what the story of this week is all about. <laughs>